What's up everyone? It is nice to see you again, or I should say once more. If this is your first time hearing my voice or seeing my face, please go check out the other things on my channel. It's been a while, go check it out. But today I wanted to talk about the Borderlands series and why I just love it so much and also why the movie pretty much failed at the box office. But the first thing I want to talk about is why I love this series so much and why it's, I just hold it so dear to my heart. Back when I was 12 or 13, me and my cousin were in Target, just roaming for games as you do when you were younger and anybody that knows, knows because it's a, just a nostalgia thing for the most part. And he picks up this game with this cycle pointing to his head like a gun and blasting out on the other side. And I remember getting it out of his hand and just kind of looking on the back of it. And I remember just looking at it and being like, I'm not the biggest fan and it's probably gonna be trash. I, I truly thought the Borderlands series was gonna be trash but long and behold we got to the house because we ended up buying it and I ended up playing it and loving this series entirely from the prequel to Borderlands 1 to 2 to 3 and eventually 4 which was announced by the director and him working on it currently right now. I mean you have so many characters you have Maya, you have Lilith, you have Roland, Mordecai, Brick, Dr. Zed, Tiny Tina, Krieg, and so many more characters that really drive uh, the storytelling and the force behind the entire series in general. And you really begin to love these characters and get to know these characters. And just to give you a little tidbit about what's happening, what's going on, this is kind of like a futuristic steampunk sort of world for the most part. Some people might argue with me about the steampunk aspect, but I'm not here to argue that and there's different planets and you have these and they essentially go on all of these adventures. Obviously the villain within the series or I guess the most prominent would probably be Atlas, especially in the second one, but they're not as prevalent in the first one when it comes to Borderlands 1, but they're more prevalent in the prequel series that is before Borderlands 1 in general. The main thing you need to know is that Iridians are a part of this world. They are an ancient race that creates magical technology and items that people use throughout the world. They also supposedly engineered the sirens, well I won't say supposedly, but if you have played the games, read the books or anything like that, you will know, but if not, that is kind of like a spoiler, but seven sirens are able to exist at one time, all of them having different abilities, each of them having different types of blue tattoos on them, and most of them are pale women for the most part, but we did get our first siren that is Amara that has a more darker skin tone and looks to be of another race, but we also have these three ladies here that are also sirens that are very popular within the series. We have Lilith, we have Maya, and we have Angel. And then obviously Amara. And there's other sirens that we have not met yet in the series so that's why I'm excited for Borderlands 4 because these women really drive what is actually happening within the world and these sirens basically drive the complexities of the story along with different bandits, different villains, what does it mean to be a vault hunter? What does it mean to gather loot? What does it mean to have different types of guns? What does it mean to have friends, friendship? What does it mean to be a leader? And this game has really been able to cultivate. It has kind of like a cult classic in some aspect. But I will say the first Borderland game is, but I will say the first Borderland is kind of like a niche genre. So it was kind of a weird time to be there playing the game in its first in its first iteration. But as you get to Borderlands 2 and Borderlands 3, especially with its art style, you begin to appreciate a lot of what's actually happening. The second thing I want to talk about is the Borderland movie being announced all the way back in 2015. In 2016 I graduated. That's basically letting you know that I've been waiting for the movie to come out for some time. But then we get to the casting. And the casting is probably where the most disruption and distaste kind of came from. But a lot of us fans didn't really pay it any mind because there's a lot of movies that are announced that never come out. Either ridiculous, missing a lot of plot points, watered down, or just not good overall. But with this Borderland movie coming out, and I won't be mentioning everybody's name that is in the cast because some people weren't that big of an issue or anything like that. But going back to the casting, we have Kate Blanchett as Lilith, Kevin Hart as Roland, no Brick, no Mordecai, no Dr. Zed. We have Tiny Tina. We have Creed. We have Tennis that is played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Now, for the lineup, you look at the casting and you're like, hmm. Now, I'm gonna go through all of these characters real quick in a quick spoof, just to make sure that I'm catching you up with everything. Brick is Brick is this giant of a character that smashes walls, breaks things, but also is super lovable and kind. Kind of ditzy for the most part, 
but also does have a heart. We have Mordecai and his bird that are actually really cool aspects of the game itself, and it's kind of sad not to be able to see them within the movie. Mordecai had the ability to use Bloodwing to fly around killing enemies and stuff like that, was really good with the sword, and had these really cool goggles that he would wear in the game. And I think he also had dreads for the most part. I believe so. But Mordecai has a super cool personality, super smooth, super dope. Then you have Lilith, the Siren. Super fiery, raw in her personality, and was also learning her abilities at the time. So having a character like that as well allows for a lot more complex storytelling to happen in general. Then you have Roland, the, the soldier, the one that doesn't really need a lot of people, kind of isolated to himself, but learns that friendship is something that is worth fighting for. And those are the main characters that I personally want to talk about because obviously they're in the movie. Or some of them are in the movie. Kate Blanchett as Lilith doesn't really make any sense to me because Lilith in Borderlands 1 is about 24 to 25 and her age has a lot to do with how rambunctious she is, how she's learning her powers, and just the overall package with their character. And Kate Blanchett's persona of Lilith within the movie, just from the trailers alone, makes her seem more grumpy and like she doesn't really want to do things and she doesn't seem excited. And one thing you'll get from Lilith in the game, especially Borderlands 1, going into Borderlands 2, is that she fucking loves her ability. She loves her power. She likes being a siren. And then you have Brick and Mordecai that are basically absent. A lot of people are criticizing that Kate Blanchett's age is an issue. And quite frankly, I find it as an issue too. Not because she's not a great actress. I loved her as Hela. And I wish that they brought her back within the Thor series. And they might, I don't know, they might. But I loved her as Hela. But Lilith, it just doesn't work because the reimagining of Lilith being older than what she is changes the narrative of the story and how she learns of how she learns. And we have Jamie Lee Curtis as Tannis, which I didn't think that that casting was necessarily bad, but I definitely, I definitely see the whole cast being younger people, especially like around their either mid twenties, late twenties, early thirties. But again, most of the fans did not pay attention to the casting, let alone the movie itself, because everyone was kind of confused, but also kind of excited about it, but also just kind of threw it out the window as something that, that might end up being just like Dragon Ball Z. The third thing I want to talk about is taking liberties versus making an adaptation. An adaptation when it comes to book to movie or book to series or game to series or game to movie is that some things are going to be taken out, some things are going to get smoothed over, some things are going to change when it comes to adaptations. Maybe a fight scene or maybe this scene is merged with this scene or this character's arc is merged with this character's arc and now they're one person. Some adaptations have to happen like that just to make the overall flow of a movie better. And then we have liberties. Those who just kind of take something and then reform it or reboot the series in a way that is just completely different from the actual source material. At least when you're adapting something, you're still taking a lot of things from the source material, like the comics, the books, the games. Taking your own liberties is kind of taking the essence of what it is, like the characters and the world itself, and then flipping it on its head, making it something completely different than what it is. And that's essentially what they did with Borderlands. Flipped it on its head and changed every single thing about the characters, including who's in it, who's not, what game they're actually a part of, whether it's one, two, or three, Tiny Tina and Krieg are not introduced until Borderlands 2. One, Krieg is a DLC character, so I think that his character always had room to improve and give him an actual storyline. Obviously, seeing his story aside with the very small little echoes that he may get, Krieg could have had an actual story that didn't go forced or anything like that and Tiny Tina actually has a really strong backstory so for her to all of a sudden be the person that can open the vault doesn't really make any real sense now you may be thinking what is a vault vaults usually have treasure ancient aliens from the Iridians etc to lock away formidable foes and villains and creatures and stuff like that and our vault hunters are essentially what they are they look for vaults whether they're on the planet of Pandora or other planets within the universe iridium is something that charges a lot of these gates and sirens are able to essentially absorb this iridium like a drug making their abilities immensely more powerful therefore making them more powerful but it also connects them to the iridium again as like a drug or an addiction in some ways some shape or form 
Lilith is probably the only person that uses Iridium and has gotten supercharged off of it to where she is no longer addicted to the Iridium itself. But that's getting into the weeds about what's canon and what's not, why she doesn't use it in the third game compared to the second game, etc, etc. It is what it is, like I'm, I'm not here to argue that. The other cool aspect that Borderlands has, especially one, is that there's no real story. There's a vault at the end of the game where you end up killing it and getting all the treasures out of it. You're kind of fighting Atlas as a very obscure villain, but you're mostly fighting other villains that are part of the story. And then other than that, mostly everybody else is obscure characters and most of the plot development is kind of happening between conversation and little things that happen. So I guess in my head is what I'm really trying to say is that the director of the movie could have made something very special because Borderlands 1, again, doesn't really have much of a story. So the liberties were there, but you still had to take some of the source material to actually have a story. And then what we got, and essentially what we got is an amalgamation of just random thoughts thrown together. The next thing that I want to talk about, or at least the fourth thing I want to talk about, is the box office. Currently right now, Borderlands the movie is sitting at 8.8 .8 million dollars with a budget of 115 to 145 million dollars which says a lot about who's actually coming to this movie who's actually watching this Hollywood made a movie for Hollywood and didn't make a movie for fans and that's a lot of the issues we run into when we see a lot of these games to movies and why Dragon Ball Z or Death Note just don't work the the it's the liberties that Hollywood takes and tries to change the the foundation of what makes these comics and games so cool along with books obviously and ultimately why Hollywood just never really listens to fans the one movie that I have in mind where the actual director and the studio themselves listen to the fans is with Sonic Sonic looked like garbage but since there was a fan outcry of why sonic looks like a munchkin for some reason they changed his design and now sonic has not one not two not three movies but also a show but that's all i have for you today please go check out the other things on my channel like comment share and i hope that you like this video and i will see all of you later